I want to invite you to bow your heads with me as we ask God's presence as we open his word. Father God, thank you for inviting us again to come to worship. Lord, you have given us the gift of the Sabbath, 24 hours of uninterrupted time with you. And Father, we get to spend part of that time with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And so, Father, I pray your spirit would be here in a mighty way. Lord, open our hearts. Lord, open our ears to hear your word. And, Father, may the words of my mouth, may the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So you might have noticed that the title of the sermon is Living Out Your Identity. So we're going to talk about who we are. Our identity. So let me start by sharing a little about my identity, parts and pieces of who I am. So I am not a native Texan. You probably have figured up that out by the way that I talk. That's all right. I got here as soon as I could. Twelve years ago, we moved from Texas, but I grew up in western Pennsylvania, in the mountains of western Pennsylvania, outside a city called Johnstown which Johnstown's claim to fame is Johnstown. the Johnstown Flood. Few people know that. Actually, the city of Johnstown has had three floods in its history. The one that everybody knows about, or most people know about, is the one in 1889. That The dam was actually only about four miles from where I grew up, and uh, it killed over 2,000 people in the Connemaw Valley. In 1936, there was a second flood, and then in my lifetime... Back in 1977, we had a third flood. And so that is Johnstown's claim to fame, other than steel mills, which many of them closed or downsized significantly over the course of the 1980s and the 1990s. But that's home for me. Family still lives in Johnstown and the surrounding areas. But it is an absolutely beautiful part of of the world, but I am a Pennsylvanian. I will always be a Pennsylvanian as long as we live in Texas, which we love living in the great Republic of Texas. I will always be a Pennsylvanian. But not only am I a Pennsylvanian, I am also a husband. My wife, Deborah, and I just celebrated our 26th wedding anniversary last week. And if there was ever a woman ready for translation, it was my wife. She is an amazing woman. Right now, she is teaching Sabbath school in our home church back in North Texas. Three out of four Sabbaths, she still attends the church that we were a part of, or I was a pastor of, for, for ten and a half years. And so she is an amazing woman. She loves kids. She was a nurse for much of her career. And then after we came to Texas, she decided to have a midlife crisis. And she decided to go to grad school. And so she went to grad school, got her master's degree, and became a speech-language pathologist. And every day she gets to work with junior high and high school kids in a local school district in DFW. And so I am blessed to be a husband of my wife, Deborah. But I'm also a father. I have two kids. I have a son, Mark, who is 18, who is literally weeks away from graduating from high school. And it can't happen soon enough for him. In the fall, he will actually be going back to Pennsylvania, where he was born, and going to a school called Waynesburg University. He wants to be a sports broadcaster. And uh, I'm excited to see what he, how God is going to use him in that field. And so he's heading back to the homeland to go to school. But he is an amazing kid. He's going to do well in, in that field. I have a 15-year-old daughter, a freshman in high school, who is going on 35. My wife and I talk many times about maybe we should just charge our daughter rent because that's, we hardly see her. When she's at school, we don't see her. When she's home, she's up in her room. She is very independent. She is a very, very, very smart young lady, mature beyond her years. And I'm excited to see what God's going to do in her life in her high school years and then as she, she goes on. But I am a very proud father. If you're here this afternoon, you'll get a chance to see a picture of my family that God blessed me with. And so I am a Pennsylvanian. I'm a father. I'm a husband. In case you haven't figured it out, I'm also a pastor. I know I don't look old enough, 
But I've been a pastor for 27 years. I started in the Pennsylvania conference, my home conference. The last place I wanted to be was in my home conference. But I received a call to um, be an associate pastor in a church outside of Philadelphia. And then we got banished to seminary. And then after we came back from seminary, God blessed us with three churches in north central Pennsylvania. You may have heard of one of the cities, Williamsport, which every August the eyes of the sports world turn to Williamsport because that's where the Little League World Series takes place. And we had an amazing ministry in Williamsport, Lock Haven, and Lewisburg. Two of the three churches were small, so I track with this. I love coming to our small churches here in Texas because there is something about small churches. And then God said, I'm going to change it up on you. I'm going to call you to Texas. And I said, really? And he said, yes. And so for the last, for 10 and a half years, beginning in 2011, we, I was one of the five pastors at the Arlington Church in North Texas. So I went from a three church district to a church that has three services. The first Sabbath I preached there, I preached to more people on a Sabbath than I did over the course of a quarter when I was in my three churches in Pennsylvania. But we had an amazing ministry at Arlington. And then in January of 2022, I was asked to become the Associate Director for Ministry and Evangelism at the conference. And it is my dream job. I love pouring into pastors, supporting our pastors. We have great pastors here in the Texas conference. We have young pastors like Pastor Ledesma, but we also have Middle-aged pastors like myself, but we also have pastors who are toward the end of their careers. And I love seeing them pouring into our younger pastors. And so I get to travel all over our conference, which, praise God, is only the eastern two-thirds of Texas, which is big enough as it is. But um, I will always be a pastor. I love pastoring, whether it be pastoring in the local church or now pastoring the pastors of this field. So I am a Pennsylvanian. I am a husband. I am a father. I'm a pastor. I'm a college graduate. Actually, three times. Did my undergrad at a small school that you may have heard of, Washington Adventist University. Back in my day, in the dark ages, it was called Columbia Union College. And while I did theology there, got a great diploma on, for my wall. The best investment I made was that's where I met my beautiful wife. Then, as I said, we got banished to Andrews where I did my Master of Divinity. And I will say this, I thought Western Pennsylvania had winter. Then I spent a couple of winters in Southwest Michigan. And you ain't seen winters till you've been in Bering Springs, Michigan in January. And then I did my doctorate in 2011, graduated in 2011. Fortunately, I did not have to move to Andrews. I could do two-week stints for intensives, and they always scheduled the intensives after school was out. So I knew very likely, not always assured though, that I would never see snow when I went to Andrews. But I've had a great college and post-graduate post degree um, opportunities at Andrews and at Columbia Union. And so I'm a, I am a Pennsylvanian, I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a pastor, I'm a college graduate. I'm a sports fan. I'm a huge sports fan. Now being from Western Pennsylvania, you might be able to guess which teams I root for. And so in 2011, when it was made abundantly clear we were to come to Texas, I thought God was playing a joke on me. I said, you want me to go to Texas? And he said, yes. He said, but not only do I want you to go to Texas, I want you to go to North Texas. I'm like, oh. And then as if that wasn't enough, he said, no, 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 I don't want you just to go to North Texas. I want you to go to a place called Arlington, where every day for 10 and a half years, on my drive from my home to the church, off in the distance, I would see that edifice to what people call America's team and to Jerry Jones. Now, I will admit this when it comes to sports fans. I was going to lay low. I was going to be cool. I wasn't going to be too crazy when it came to pointing out that my Steelers have more Super Bowls than the Cowboys do. 
But the first Sabbath we were introduced at Arlington, three services, my senior pastor outed us as Steelers fan, and the congregation in all three services literally booed us. And then I knew, Lord, I am a missionary in a strange land. And it was on. But I absolutely love sports. It's my way of decompressing. And then to have a kid going into sports broadcasting, that is very much I'm excited for that. But I love my Steelers. I love my Penguins. I love my Pirates who are 1-0, which were first place at least for today. But I absolutely love sports. I, I have picked up some of the Texas teams. I like the Rangers, like the Stars, like FC Dallas, like the Mavs. But I love sports. And so if you want to talk, we, we can always talk sports. But I'm a Pennsylvanian. I'm a husband. I'm a father. I'm a pastor, college graduate. I'm a sports fan. This part of my identity, I hate to admit, though many people already know, I am middle-aged. Not only am I middle-aged, I'm a middle-aged Caucasian guy. I'm middle class. I have certain theological beliefs. I have certain political beliefs. All of these pieces and parts, being a Pennsylvanian, being a husband, being a father, are all parts of my identity. And what's interesting is as I look out there this morning, I see some of you have some of the same attributes and parts of your identity that I do. I see some middle-aged Caucasian guys out there. I probably don't see any Steelers fans, but we have some parts of our identity in common. But what I want to share with you this morning is there is a part of our identity that we all have in common. Turn with me, or if you have your devices, however you look up scripture, to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. We know the story. But I want to begin reading in verse 26. Here's what it says. Then God said, let us make mankind in our, what's the word? Image. Image in our likeness so that they may rule over the fish in the sea, the birds of the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Verse 27. So God created mankind in his own what? Image. image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. We know the creation story, right? God said, let there be light, and there was light. Let there be water, let there be air, let there be birds and fish, let there be animals. Everything that was created up to day six was created with the voice of God immediately. And then came his crowning creation. He said, let us make mankind in our, what's the word? Image, Image and in our likeness. And God while he had the power to speak humanity into being, right? He says, I'm going to do something different to show how loved they are. And so he took his hands and he created Adam out of the dirt. And he breathed the breath of life in him. And all of a sudden, Adam opened his eyes and saw his creator. And then he said, it is not good for man to be alone. And so then he created Eve by taking the rib of Adam and did the exact same thing. And he says, these two, Adam and Eve, are created in our image and in our likeness. And I truly wish that I could say that Adam and Eve lived happily ever after. I wish I could say that. But we know the story, don't we? Genesis 3 happens. Eve is out looking around and all of a sudden she sees this serpent in the tree and she goes to investigate. And all of a sudden she begins to have a conversation because the serpent asks her a question. He says, did God really tell you 
truly tell you that you can't eat from any tree in the garden. Now I wish that I could tell you that the next verse in Genesis chapter 3 says that and Eve walked away. But that's not what it says. She decides she wants to set the serpent's facts straight. She wants to make sure he understands. So she says, no, let me tell you what he really said. He said, we can eat from any tree in the garden except for one. And she said, God told us that the moment we eat it, the moment we touch it, we will die. Now I wish that Eve, after setting the serpent's facts straight, would have turned around and walked away and lived happily ever after. But that's not what happened. He says, that's not true. God's holding out from you. He knows the moment that you eat this fruit, you will be like him. Interesting life. Weren't they already like him in his image and in his likeness? But he says, you're not going to die. God's holding back from you. You have to do something to add to what God has already done. You have to add to something God has already created you in his, eye, in his image and in his likeness. You need to add to your identity, in other words. And oh, how I wish that the story would say, and Eve looked the serpent square in the eye and said, I am created in the image and likeness of my heavenly father. I'm good. Thank you much. Have a good day. But that's not what happened. She believed him. She said, maybe, just maybe, I have to do something to add to my identity. That maybe the identity God created me with is not enough. And so she took the fruit. She ate it. She gave some to Adam. And the moment they ate it, we're told, is their eyes were open and they realized they were naked. And immediately they had to do something. They found fig leaves. And the sad thing is, my friends, that from that moment in the Garden of Eden millennia ago to this day, we are falling for the same lie Eve fell for. We are not satisfied in our identity as created in the image and likeness of God. Instead, we say we have to do something ourselves to create our own identity. And so we focus on things. We focus on how big our bank account is. We focus on what job we have. We focus on what diplomas we have. We focus on what position we have at work. We focus on what position we have in the church. We focus in on our ethnicity. We focus in on our theological beliefs. We focus in on our political beliefs. And we make all of these other pieces of our identity more important than the fact that we are created in the image and likeness of God. And when we do that, when we make our socioeconomic status above our identity as made in the likeness and image of God, when we put our political beliefs above our identity as created in the image and likeness of God, when we put our position in the church above our, our identity as created in the image and likeness of God, we are falling for the same lie Eve did millennia ago in the Garden of Eden. I would like to submit to you that our primary, our foundational identity is we are created in the image and likeness of Almighty God. 
foundational, primary, and every other part of our identity is subservient to the fact that we are created in the image and likeness of God. And every time we get things out of kilter, every time they get out of whack and we put these other parts of our identity above our identity as created in the image and likeness of God, we fall for the lie Satan told Eve in the Garden of Eden. That how God created you is not enough. So what does that look like? What does it mean to be created in the image and likeness of God? I want you to turn to 1 John. I think when I sent the scripture reading, I flipped the scripture. Because we're going to go to 1 John 3, 1. Again, I'm middle-aged, it happens. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1. One of my favorite scriptures. Here's what John says. He says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called what? Children. Children of God. And that is what we are, he says. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. John takes this idea of creating the image and he says, let me tell you a little more. He says, see, examine, understand. And what are we to understand? He says, understand the great love the Father has for us. Now, I'm sure all of you know that the Bible was not originally written in English. How I wish it were. Because I probably would have a much fuller head of hair. Because I had to take Greek. I had to take Hebrew. But the New Testament was written in Greek. And you probably know that the word love in English actually could have a couple of Greek words behind it. So the first is phileo. Which is brotherly love, friendly love. It's where the city of Philadelphia gets its name from, the city of brotherly love. Phileo, it's the friendship love. But there's another word that could be translated love, and that is eros, romantic love. The kind of love that makes your heart beat fast when you see a certain someone. You get butterflies in their stomach, in your stomach. And yeah, that happens after 26 years. But that's romantic love. But there's a third Greek word that can be translated love. What is it? What is it? Agape. Agape. Unconditional, unending love. Love that is a decision, not a feeling. Would you like to take a guess what kind of love it's talking about here what the Greek word is that is translated love. It is agape. So John is saying, see, examine what great, unconditional, unending love that the Father has lavished on us. When I read this scripture, I'm like, man, how can I explain what lavish, what it's really talking about there? And then it hit me. How many of you are grandparents? You guys are unique. Because when you become grandparents, something changed in you dramatically. I don't want to say you lost your mind, but you're like a different person. Yes. My kids have two grandmothers. My mom and my mother-in-law. My mother-in-law waited until she was 70 years old till she became a grandma for the first time. 
Now, when my wife was growing up, she was not allowed to have Fruit Loops. Fruit Loops were banned in the brawl house. The only way my wife could even taste the Fruit Loop was if she traded something in her lunch for contraband Fruit Loops at school. And that went, ban went on throughout Deborah's entire childhood. And then my son is born. And my mother-in-law all of a sudden becomes a grandma. And all of a sudden now, the ban on Fruit Loops becomes lifted. And now, all of a sudden, you wonder if she has stock in Kellogg's. There's so many boxes of Fruit Loops in her pantry. You grandparents are different. Because how you treated your kids, you loved them. But the way you treat your grandkids... You lavish your love on them. That's what, God, that's what John is talking about. If he were using the word picture, he'd say, see what kind of love the grandparents have for their grandchildren. That's how much God loves us. John says, see what great love the Father has lavished on us. I love what it says in Matthew. It says, as parents, and I, and I think it probably should say, as grandparents, you know how to give your kids good gifts or grandkids good gifts. I'm sure every time you see your grandkids, you have something for them. I'm sure, if nothing else, a huge grandma, grandpa hug. But Jesus says, as parents, you know how to give good gifts to your children, but how much more does our Heavenly Father give gifts to us as His children? John says, see, understand what great unending, unconditional love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called what? Children of God. Now, I will admit, I truly thought I understood this verse. I had read it many times. I had studied it even in the original language. I thought I understood what John was talking about when he says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called His children. I thought I understood it, but I didn't. And I can tell you the exact moment in time that I truly understood what John was talking about here in 1 John 3, 1. The time was 11.28 p.m., August 17th, 2004. My wife is pregnant with our first child. We didn't know if it was going to be a boy or a girl. We decided there are a few surprises in life anymore, so we're going to not find out. We're going to wait till the child is born. Now, my son, being my son, decided to be late. <laughs> and so my wife goes into her doctor, and the doctor says, you know, you're getting a little ways past your due date. We're going to have to induce. And so that morning, we go to the hospital. We are escorted to the room where we're going to spend the next number of hours my wife is in the bed. She's given the medication to start the labor process, and we wait. And we wait. And we wait some more. This should have been an indication of what my kid was going to be like for the next 18 years. And then at 4 o'clock in the afternoon... All of a sudden, out of nowhere, my wife grabs my hand and grabs my shirt and just starts to scream. <laughs> and does not let up. Unfortunately for her and me, the anesthesiologist was a tad bit late to come up to give her her epidural. 
So I was convinced I was going to walk out of that hospital with a 2XL shirt. She was grabbing it so hard. And I was going to be called stumpy because I was going to lose one of my fingers. But finally, the anesthesiologist comes, the epidural is given, and all of a sudden now I get my hands back and my stretched shirt is now just on me. The doctor keeps coming back and forth. And finally, about 11 o'clock, she comes in and she says the word every pregnant mother wants to hear. It's time to push. And so the pushing begins. And I will admit, I thought I knew what to expect when it came to childbirth. I'd watched some videos. I'd gone to birthing class. Probably would have gotten an A if there were a test. I truly thought I knew what to expect. And so I heard the doctor who actually was one of our members in one of our churches, she said, I can see the baby's head. And I'm like, sweet. And so I moved from the top of the bed to the bottom of the bed because I want to see my child born. Plus, I want to be the first to know, is it a boy or a girl? And at 11.28, she says to me, you have a son. And I look at the kid. And I, I hate to admit this, but I will admit it because you will understand and because we're friends. The first thought when I saw my son was, ooh. <laughs> he was not good looking at all. He didn't look like a baby on TV. And I'm looking at this kid as I cut the... I'm like, ooh. Head was all... The nurse takes him. Wipes him off. Brings him back. Hands him to my wife. And I look at him like, well, didn't really improve in the looks at all. And then she, my wife says to me, she said, Tom, would you like to hold him? And I said, sure. And she hands me to him. And I'm, as I'm holding my son for the first time, and I look down into his not-so-good-looking face, I immediately understood what John was talking about. Because in that moment, I realized that if anybody came into that hospital room and wanted to do my son harm, I would protect him at all costs in addition to maybe even giving my life for him. And in that moment, I recognized that here's this kid, my son, my child, who brings absolutely nothing to the table. I mean, Nada, nothing. He isn't good looking. <laughs> Fortunately, he got better looking as time went on, as you'll see. He's going to keep us up for hours upon hours over the next number of months. He's going to cost us an arm and a leg in diapers and in clothes and in stuff. This kid brought absolutely nothing to the table other than he was my son. And because he was my son, I was willing to give my life for him if need be. And I went, oh. So if that's how I feel about my son, how much more does God feel that about me? Because I am his son. Well, as kids do, they not only get better looking as they get older, but they also grow up. And they become teenagers. And I have discovered that teenagers across the board are good at two things. The first thing teenagers are good at is they are good at 
not believing anything mom and dad says. I could say, Mark and Caroline, the sky is blue, and they'll go, Dad, really? Did you check it on the internet? Are you sure? And yet, someone else could say to my son and my daughter, the sky is blue, and they will come running to me and say, Dad, did you know the sky is blue? And the other thing all teenagers are good at, they're good at rolling their eyes at their parents. So for a number of years before, I, before our son Mark got his driver's license, I took our kids to school every day. So it's about 20 to 25 minutes from our home to the school, and they were captive audiences for 20 to 25 minutes. Even if they wanted to, they were not going to jump out of the car at 80 miles an hour on I-20. So they, I had them. Now, for whatever reason, my kids decided to both sit in the back seat. I have a two-door car, a little car, but they decided to sit in the back seat. I don't know if they want to feel like I'm their chauffeur or what. Well, I don't know. But on one of these trips, I decided to have a talk with them. And I looked up in the rear view mirror and caught both of their eyes, and I said, Mark and Caroline, I'm about to tell you something. And immediately I got the eye roll. And I said, Mark and Caroline, there is nothing in this world that you can do that will make me love you anymore. And immediately the eyes rolled. And then they start, but dad, what if we get into Harvard? Nope. Dad, what if we get all A's for the rest of our high school, our college, our graduate? Nope. What if we become a doctor? What if we become a lawyer? What if we become president of the United States? That's not going to make you love us anymore. And I go, nope. Nothing you can do will make me love you anymore because I love you with everything I have. And then the eye roll. And then I followed up with this. I said, Mark, Caroline, there is nothing in this world that will make me love you any less. And I swear their eyes were going to roll into the back of their head. It was so obnoxious. They say, wait a minute, Dad, are you telling me that, that if we get five tattoos and 20 piercings, you're not going to love it? Nope. Do you mean if we become a... Nope. Do you mean if we get thrown into jail because we're... No. I said, Mark, Caroline, there is nothing in this world that will make me love you any less because you are my kids. I said, Mark, Caroline, there will be many things that you will do that I will not be a huge fan of. There will be things that you do that I don't appreciate or don't agree with. But Mark and Caroline, there is nothing in this world you can do that will make me love you any less. Because you are, will always Always be my children. I got to the office that day after having that, what I thought was a profound conversation with my kids. And I began to reflect and I said, wait a minute. If that's how I feel about my kids, God says the same thing to me. He says, Tom, because you are my son, there is nothing in this world that will make me love you anymore. And all of a sudden, I get offended when I think about that. Because I go, but, but God, I'm a, I'm a pastor. Doesn't that get me a few more brownie points? I've worked for the church for a quarter of a century. Doesn't that get me? Nope. But I pay my tithe. I keep Sabbath. I know the 28 fundamental beliefs backwards. For, you're telling me that the... And he goes, Tom, there is nothing in this world you can do that will get brownie points with me. Because I love you with everything I am. And 
And in the quietness of that moment in my office at the Arlington Church, I then thought, wait a minute. God, are you telling me that there's nothing in this world that will make me, that I will do that will make me love, that will make you love me any less? And I say to him, but God, you know this, that, or the other thing. And he goes, nope. I still love you. You know the... Nope. God says, there is nothing in this world, Tom, that you can do that will make me love you any less. Now, I'm convinced that when I see Jesus for the first time, on the first day of eternity, he is going to have a huge palm print on his forehead for all of the dumb mistakes that I have made in my life. Because he'll look at me and say, Tom, oh, I can't believe you did that. But he says, nothing you do will make me love you any less because you are my son. He says, I love you so much that even while you were a mess or while you're still a mess, I came and died for you. Amen. Because you are my child created in my image and created in my likeness. And he says, Tom, never forget who you are. John says, see what great love the Father has lavished upon us that we should be called the children of God who loves us with an everlasting, unending love that loved us so much he was willing to leave the splendor of heaven to come and die the death I deserve so that I can spend eternity with him. That's who I am. I am a child of my heavenly Father. And I will admit, many times I forget who I am. Many times I put the other parts of my identity above the fact I am a child of God created in His image and in His likeness. I forget who I am. I forget that I am a child of God first and foremost. Can I take it a step further? I know it's past 12. I don't hear any stomach scrolling just yet, so we may be okay. So, if I am a son of God, if you are a daughter of God, if you're a son of God, if you're a daughter of God, what does that make us to each other? Brothers and sisters. We're siblings, right? One of the greatest tragedies that I have seen in the church over the last number of years is I have seen people, sons and daughters of God, treating their brothers and sisters with disdain. I've seen families who would have lunch together, whose kids grew up together. All of a sudden, because they forgot who they were and they focused on other things, no longer talk to each other. Because they differ in political belief. They differ in ethnicity. They differ in you name it. And I say to myself, it's bad enough that the world is so focused on the divisions that we have. That they're the ones helping us make our identity, our political beliefs, our ethnicity, our socioeconomic, where we live, all of these things more important. They are making that who we are. And it's one thing for that to happen in the world, but it's another thing for it to happen in the church of Jesus Christ. 
But I have seen church after church after church and talk to pastor after pastor after pastor who says, Tom, I don't understand this family. These families used to talk to each other, but now because they voted for different people or because they have different views on what's going on in the world, they no longer talk to each other or they've left the church. And my heart breaks because I realize that in those moments, those folk have forgotten who they are. That first and foremost, they are children of God and brothers and sisters in Christ. Can I read something to you from the writings of Ellen White? She wrote this in 1889. So keep that in mind. She says this. She says, union is strength. Division is weakness. When those who believe pleasant truth are united. Time out. Who is she talking about? He's talking about us. The church. When those who believe present truth are united, they exert a telling influence. In other words, when the church is united, they do great things for the kingdom of God. That's what she's saying. And I wish she would have ended there. But she says this, she says, Satan well understands this. Nevermore, she writes, was he determined then now, writing in 1889, Never more was he, never was he more determined than now to make none affect the truth of God by causing bitterness and dissension among the Lord's people. She could be writing this in 2023 and it would apply as much today as it did when she first penned it in 1889. Can I paraphrase what she's saying? She says, when the church of God, with this end time, magnificent message, when they are united, they do great things for the kingdom of God. And Satan understands this so much so that he tries to undermine it by sowing dissension among brothers and sisters in Christ. Never more has this been true than in April of 2023 in the church of God. A question I get all the time throughout my travels throughout the conference is this. Pastor, why isn't our church growing? Why isn't our church growing? And I point them to the words of Jesus on that Thursday night before the crucifixion. He said, the world will know you are my disciples when you what? He didn't say when you get all your theology straight. He doesn't say that when you get your life together. He simply says, the world will know you are my disciples when you what? Love one, love one another. Would you like to take a guess what Greek word is behind that word love? Agape. He says the world will see a difference in the disciples of Jesus Christ when we unconditionally love each other as God loves us. And I am convinced that when this church in Mount Pleasant, throughout the Texas Conference, throughout the Southwestern Union, throughout the North American Division, throughout the world, when we begin to truly love one another, the world will stand up and take notice. 
Because they will see a diverse group of people who know who they are. That they are children of God created in His image and in His likeness. And they love each other and celebrate their diversity instead of making that diversity points of division. So here's my challenge. And then we'll go eat. Remember who you are. And in remembering who you are, Live out who you are. Don't live out the fact that you're a Republican, a Democrat, and independent. Don't live out that you are Caucasian or African American or Asian. Don't live out that you're at a social, social economic level. Don't live out that you're middle aged, more mature, young. Live out that you are a child of the living God created in His image and in His likeness and loved with an everlasting love. Amen. That when we do that, my friends, you will see a difference in this church and you'll see the folk of Mount Pleasant and Titus County say, that group of people's different. They know who they are. And I want what they have. Because I'm convinced the world is tired of the division. We just don't know how to get out of the muck. And when we as God's people live out who we are, we will see the world stand up and take notice and say, I want that. Because that is true love. That is what community is all about. So it's my prayer today that each of us would live out our identity so that the world may see who Jesus truly is. Amen. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for creating us in your image and in your likeness and calling us your children. Father, may every moment of every day, we may, may we not only remember who we are, but may we live out who we are, that others may see Jesus in us. Thank you for this great privilege we have to be called your sons and daughters. And we look forward to that day very soon where we get to be a part of that heavenly throng worshiping and praising your name. But until that day comes, may we keep our eyes focused on you because we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.